One foot in the sunlight, the other in the night. It's easy in the middle, but I don't want to be fine. Show me that I need you. Open up my eyes. I don't want to fall back. Cause I don't want to live right. And I don't want it. If you're not in there, no more halfway. I'm moving forward now. I can't fake another day on my own. Holding on to all I need to let go. Every day I want Happy 4th of July, our country's 245th birthday. Let's give the Lord a round of applause. Man, we just came back off camp at Super Summer in Missouri. Illinois had a camp over in Missouri just to avoid all the COVID stuff. And we had God show up in the midst. You got some young people sitting on the front row. But let me tell you, God showed up in a mighty way we had 160 we had about 165 kids there we offered a course on how to pray with vim and vigor okay that's about the best way i can put it phil Nelson led this thing he's been praying for years and you know common sense would tell you this is an elective we only have like 20 kids they got some other electives they could choose they could go do some other things we had 120 kids sign up for that course. 120 kids bowed and prayed that week. And that's been awesome. That's just been kind of like the highlight of our camp. God showed up. Kids got saved. We saw answers to prayer. Man, the kids are on fire, okay? That is awesome. We need to praise our God for such a great opportunity we had to go to camp this week. So... Man, we're getting to go to New Orleans. Your church family needs to pray for us. We are going to leave Tuesday, and I did tell Barb we are leaving here at 4.30 in the morning. She goes, Brent, how can you be conscious at that time? I said, the sun's not up. I'm good, all right? So once the sun comes up, I have a big problem, but sun's not up. So you be praying for your uh, youth, your parents that are going on this. We're going down to New Orleans. We're going to stay at New Orleans Seminary. And these seminary students have got this program going all the time, how they're trying to reach New Orleans for Christ. And I thought that was a great way for us to piggyback our men's New Orleans trip and get our kids kind of 
pumped, get our families pumped on reaching people for Christ. So that's awesome. So that's what we're going to be doing this week. And today is a great day to be alive. This is the 4th of July. We are going to celebrate out the park at 4 o'clock with a picnic. We're going to have hot dogs, hamburgers, and a special dessert that some of you all are making. So that would be awesome. But then Dwayne stepped it up a notch and said, it's not the 4th of July without some ice cream, some homemade ice cream. So if you got a churn and you want to make some homemade ice cream, bring it with you and we'll all enjoy it. And then at 5 to 7, we've got the park pool. We're going to swim. We're going to have a great time fellowshipping. I'm going to have some music going. It's going to be a great time. If you just want to hang out and watch the kids, that's great. We're going to have a good time. And then we got the fireworks. So, man, this is going to be a good 4th of July. You guys ready to celebrate? Yeah. All right. Awesome. To make this service even more special, I want to uh, kind of draw our attention to our country. And here is a video. Independence has never been easy. Nearly 250 years ago, it was something worth fighting for. The idea of a people who stood on equal footing, free to speak, free to wander, free to live. These were ideals worth risking everything for. Today, we find ourselves fighting old battles, not with past foes, but with ourselves. We are a nation divided, divided by skin, divided by opinion, divided by hate. It seems the very freedoms we once fought for have become stumbling blocks. Are we too busy seeking ourselves to even recognize the tragedy which surrounds us? Do we no longer see the profound need for the hand of God? In this moment, the truth of scripture rings especially true. If we, the people, will humbly pray turn from wickedness and seek his face then he will hear us he will forgive us and he will heal this land today may we remember this one simple truth true independence is found only in our dependence on god Amen. Guys, let's say our pledges today, if you'll stand. Dalton, if you'll get that flag. Post it out there. Attention. Salute. Pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now, in Christ, we're all brothers and sisters. We're going to say our pledge to the Christian flag. Jay, it's half. There you go. Attention, salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands, one brotherhood uniting all Christians in service and in love. God's roadmap, God's word, big part in how we live our life. Let's say our pledge to the Bible. Attention, salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet a light to my path, and I will hide its words in my heart that I may not sin against God. Remain standing. Mama T is going to sing God Bless America. Join me if you want. 
God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above. From the mountains to the prairies to the ocean, White with foam, God bless America, my home, sweet home. God bless America, my home, sweet home. lead our charge to worship. Heavenly Father, man, we're so thankful to have a country that was founded on godly principles. Heavenly Father, help us to be dependent on you so we can be independent. Heavenly Father, help us to honor you in every way we can, every way we need to. Heavenly Father, help us to depend so much on your blessings, so much on your strength. And dear my Father, help us to make it more about you than anything else. I'm just so thankful for all our forefathers that came before us that kept this dream alive of how they came to this country to worship freely, but to be dependent on you. I pray that we continue to do that. Be with Brother Dwayne as we have your word open today. I pray that you would shed light in each one of our hearts. Melt our hearts where they are hard. I just pray that you would continue to direct your church, direct us to be the kind of place that we need to be to honor you and to put you first. In Jesus' name I pray and all God's people said, amen. 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 Let's remain standing as we celebrate our independence today. We, as the video said, celebrate our dependence on God. Let's sing of the great things that our Lord has done. Amen. worship our King. Come let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. Yes, he has. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awaken the light. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God. You have done great things. You've been faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. And I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You will do great things. Oh, God, you do great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. Awake and alive, oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all, hallelujah, God, unshakable, hallelujah, God. 
done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. You've done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. Yes, you free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God. You have done great things. You have done great things. Oh, God, you do great things. Oh, you've done great things. You still do great things. pray together. God, thank you, Father, for the truth that you just let us sing of that you, God, do, have done, and will continue to do great things. Lord, you're going to do great things here this morning as well. So, Lord, we, we thank you, Father, for the greatest of things, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, Lord, I pray that that will fuel and drive and focus our worship today as we worship you in song. We continue to worship you in giving and in hearing and responding to the word of God. We give you thanks for everything you have in store today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. God of creation, there at the start, before the beginning of time. With no point of reference, you spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of life. And as you speak, a hundred billion galaxies are born in the vapor of your breath, the planets form. If the stars were made to worship, so will I. I could see your heart in everything you've made. Every burning star, a signal fire of grace. If creation sings your praises, so will I. God of your promise, you don't speak in vain, no syllable empty or void. For once you have spoken, all nature and science follow the sound of your voice. And as you speak, a hundred billion creatures catch your breath, evolving in pursuit of what you said. If it all reveals your nature, so will I. I can see your heart in everything you say. 
every painted sky a canvas of your grace if creation still obeys you so will I so will I So will I. If the stars were made to worship, so will I. If the mountains bow in reverence, so will I. If the oceans roar your greatness, so will I. For if everything exists to lift you high, so will I. If the wind goes where you send it, so will I. If the rocks cry out in silence, so will I. If the sum of all our praises still full shine, then we'll sing again a hundred million times. of salvation you've chased down my heart through all of my failure and pride on a hill you created the light of the world abandoned in darkness to die and as you speak a hundred billion failures disappear Where you lost your life so I could find it here If you left the grave behind you, so will I I can see your heart in everything you've done Every part designed in a work of art called love. If you gladly chose surrender, so will I. I can see your heart a billion different ways. Every precious one, a child you died to save. If you gave your life to love them, so will I. Like you would again a hundred billion times. But what measure could amount to your desire? You're the one who never leaves the one behind. We have lost as we look down the road where all the prodigals have walked. One by one, the enemy is whispered lies and let them off as slaves. But we know that you are God, yours is the victory.
right, and good morning to you. We are glad you are here today. And that last song is one of the most powerful worship songs I know. What a challenge that the rocks and the stars don't out-worship us. Amen, amen, and amen. Hey, we're, again, we're glad you're here. We're moving on through. I don't even know where we are these days, what number we are. But we're talking about the Fruit of the Week Club, and we're going through the summer looking at the various fruit of the Spirit. Spirit. We took three weeks to talk about the Holy Spirit, and this is week number two. And the actual fruit of them, they were talking about joyful, about joyful. Now, let me read something to you. I'm going to try to read it. I'm going to try to tell you but I'm going to probably have to refer to my notes. Um, it was the 75th anniversary of Forbes magazine, and they had a theme in there, and here was the theme of that magazine. Um, why we feel so bad when we have it so good. Isn't that something to think about? Why we feel so bad when we have it so good. And they, they noted that you know we Americans live better really than anybody else on the planet, and yet so much of our culture, so much of our society um, is depressed, is depressed. Um, the editor then was James Michaels, and here's what he wrote. Um, Why is this nation that marched so proudly into the 20th century slouching so dejectedly toward the third millennium? And it went on to cite the fact that there's an alarming loss of values and absolutes and meaning of contemporary life, which I found interesting because this is such a secular um, magazine. And then um, it asked the question, so what went wrong? What went wrong? And the person on the lowest economic rung of the ladder in America has it better than most everybody else in the world. And we have rights and freedoms that most of the world, every citizen in the world can only dream about. Why are we in the condition that we are? Simply, why? Well, I had not heard this quote from Abraham Lincoln. Um, I think it explains why culture is like that. Um, listen to this. This ought to really stir you. It was written in 1863 in the midst of the great Civil War. And since we are a nation pretty divided today, I think it's very appropriate. But here's what Lincoln said. We have forgotten God. How original is that? We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Isn't that powerful? Isn't that amazing? And that really explains, I think that really does explain why culture is so empty, why, why we have so much, and yet we're like a bunch of lost kids in the forest and not knowing what to do. But I don't think it explains why that's true in the church. I don't think it explains why so many Christians today are just empty. They're just, they, this is not what they signed up for. They, they, they just simply don't know what's missing in their lives. And I think, I think today's message may help that. In fact, I think this series is going to help that. But I think today's message may really help that. We have this happily joyful. And, and happily here, I think, would mean content. You know, if you, if you ever had something you just felt good, you know, I just... I'm just content. I'm happy, we would say. I'm content. And, and then this key part today is learning to be content with being joyful. Now, now you're going to have to wait, and you, some of you know this because we, it's a recurring theme in our teaching here at Dorisville, but, but how can we be content with joy? That's the big picture today um, that we want to have. How can we be happy with joy? Now, I think it's no accident that, that God in his wisdom put love and then joy, you know, it's just no accident. In fact, in fact, I think God's love is the fertile soil from which biblical joy springs. In other words, when we begin to understand just how much God loves us, a natural result of that is biblical joy. It's like, it's like putting a seed in the, in the most, you know, miracle grow. It's like putting seed in that miracle grow with fertilizer built in. And you put that seed in, and you add the water, and it just blossoms. Well, I really believe when we start understanding God's great love, how unlimited it is, how unconditional it is, when we start understanding that, um, biblical joy just springs forth. And again, I honestly believe that one of the most important precepts of our faith is this thing that we call, biblical joy. 
Now, how does that play out? What does that look like um, from Scripture? Well, where we're going to begin today, and by the way, I hope you'll get your, your Bible app out. And, you know, go to Version, go down the corner there. Uh, we have all the Scriptures and slides. Just hit the lower corner, hit Events, and all the Scriptures and slides are going to be there. You can save that on your phone, and you'll have it later on uh, during the week when you'll go back and review what we teach today. Um, but we're going to look and start with John chapter 15 and verse number 9. Now, keep in mind, in John 13, 14, and 15, Jesus is just hours away from the cross. Okay, he's just hours away from the cross. And he's sharing this this deep truth that he wants to leave behind uh, with those he has, he has poured his life into these days. And look what he says. He says this. You know, as the, now, now you've got to listen, okay? You've got to think about this. As the Father has loved me. As the, now, try, you know, I sometimes say that, you know, sometimes, Brent, we just need more letters than 26, I mean, you just, with 26 letters, you can't describe how the father loved his son. You know, there's not enough adjectives. You know, I'm a person of adjectives. I like awesome and great and cool and all that. You know, know, there there are not enough adjectives to describe how much the father loved the son. It's just not possible. But Jesus says, as the father has loved me, here's the big news. I have also loved you. We are an object of that love. We are an object, Joe, we're an object of that much love. As as the Father loved Jesus, Jesus says in the very same way. I mean, it's almost bigger. This is one time. This is one time. This is one time. This doesn't do it, it seems. When I think about as the Father loved Jesus and Jesus loves me, and I understand what he did on the cross, and I understand the physical suffering, I understand the spiritual suffering, I understand the wrath of God, I understand his Father turned his back on him. But when I think about Jesus loves me, I'm the object, object of his love, and it's just like the kind of love that God had for his son, I'm amazed. I mean, there is no, listen, there's, you know, we could go home on that. Thanks for coming to church today. Good news, God loves you as much as as he loves his son, Jesus, and Jesus loves us that much. Thanks for coming. But then he says something. He says, remain in my love. Remain in my, remain. Um, um, Take up residence. Be at home, bask, abide in my love. Now, now I think there's an issue here. Because first off, remember I told you, you you get biblical joy when you really start understanding how much God loves us. And we struggle with that because we can't understand it. We, We see our faults, our failures, our warts. And we go, I can't understand how God could ever love me that much. So we have a distorted view of what it means to remain in my love. I think for some believers, I think it's Walmart. I know some of y'all, I don't like Walmart. I go to Walmart when I have to. Um, In fact, my clock died in my home office, and I will probably go to Walmart this week and try to see if I find another clock. I'm not a Walmart fan. I, I go to Walmart when I have to, and when I do, I stay as minimal as much time as possible. Okay? I know some of you like Walmart. And that's cool. That's fine. I'm just making a point. For me, um, five minutes of Walmart once a month is probably just about enough. But some of you like Walmart. You'll go down and you walk around Walmart. You know, you'll look at Walmart. I know Terry Guess loves to go and, you know, and just talk to people. He runs into people all the time. Of course, Terry knows everybody, it seems. But, yeah, he just knows everybody. So, so I know some of you like Walmart. But I haven't met anybody who wants to live at Walmart. As much as you love Walmart, you don't want to live at Walmart. I think some of us, that's how we are with God's love. You know, you know for some people, you know, two or three minutes is enough for me once a month. This is not a major, this is not a major deal for me. This love thing, glad didn't, you know, glass in the Bible, but you know, I just don't really get it. And some of y'all say, well, you know, I, no, wait a minute, I'm not like that. I want a few minutes of it anyway. But that's a distorted view of what God says. So some of you have a hotel view of God's love. Now, Judy and I have moved almost exclusively away from hotels to Airbnb. Airbnb is a place where you can go, and it's 
just better than a hotel because you usually have a place all to yourself. It's not a room. It's a small house, and, and the price is very comparable. So, but here's the deal. You know, we, we go to a hotel, and we don't, you don't usually check into a hotel, stay three minutes, and check out. You stay a few days. You stay overnight. You stay a while. I haven't found hardly anyone who wants to live in a hotel. Well, you know, we, we're there. We're great. That's a place for us to lay our heads down at night. And if we're down at the beach, maybe we won't stay a week. But very few people say, you know, I just love Ramada Inn so much. I think I'll just live here. We don't do that. But again, we have that distorted view. Some of us have that hotel look at God's love. You know, I'm not like, I'm not like the brother who says three minutes a day is enough for me. I, I, I like to stay a while. I'm just not living there. And that cuts us short. Whether we're Walmart lovers or whether we're hotel lovers, it cuts us short. But Jesus invites us not to be like a Walmart lover. Not to be like a hotel lover, but to live there. Amen. Abide there. To stay there. Remain in my love. And then he goes on, you know, we hear from Billy Graham. And Billy Graham says this, learn to commit every situation to God. And, and trust him for the outcome. Here's why. God's love for you will never change. I love that song again. Love that song. You know, just a, just a word, God, and a hundred billion failures disappear. Woohoo! Thank the Lord for that kind of grace. You know, I know, I know, you're all perfect, but I'm not. And I'm not sure I need a hundred billion today, but I bet throughout my lifetime I've come close. God's love for you never changes. He's not going to stop loving you. Amen. I, I'm so glad that God's love is greater than my sin. Amen. I'm glad that God's grace is greater than my sin. Amen. God's love never changes. No matter what problems you face or how unsettled life becomes, God's love is the same. So surely, am I the only one that's sitting here today going, gee, Dwayne, you talked about love last week. You should have preached that last week. Hang on, it's coming. Hang on, it's coming. Then in verse number 10 of John chapter 15, Jesus continues. He says, now, if you keep my commandments, he, he, it's like a secret sauce, you know. So some of y'all do a certain thing really, really well. Some of y'all are going to do ice cream, and you're going to have this secret way of you doing it. It's just great ice cream. Well, the secrets, he gives us the secret sauce to remaining in his love. He, he gives us the secret sauce from not being Walmart lovers or hotel lovers, but from moving in, residing in his love. Well, what's the secret, Dwayne? If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. If you keep my commands. Now, I know, I know, I know. Because you're thinking command, and you're thinking do and don't. I mean, for you, the Word of God is a rule book that you better obey or else God's going to zap you. Wrong, twisted, wicked theology, wrong. Okay? That's why this is so cool. When he says, if you keep my commands, you'll remain in my love, he's saying, I've given you this glorious book called the Bible. And the whole purpose is to help you through. It's to reveal me to you and then to help you do life. That's what the Word of God's all about. It's one great story of redemption from Genesis to the book of Revelation. It's one great story of God's love and redemption for a lost world. Amen. The whole deal. The whole deal. The whole deal. And he says, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. And then he says this. Just as I have kept my father's commands and remain his love. You know, the example is me. He says, you know, he, he would say today, remember the garden? You know, we were in there and, and I was praying and, you know, God, if there's any way this cup could pass from me. Okay, please. But nevertheless, not my will, but thy will. Okay. You know, he was obedient to the father's command. So he's saying, you know, you know, you, you know what? Keep my commands, you're going to remind my love. He was, at that moment of crisis, he was abiding in the father's love. And in your moment of crisis, in your moment of crisis, if we keep the commands, 
we're going to be able to abide, take up residence in his love. Just like Jesus could. He could face the cross and that the horribleness of that because he obeyed the Father, kept the commands, and was able to abide in his love. Love. See, I want you to see the right outlook of God's Word. See, see, God's Word is like guardrails. God's Word is like guardrails I'm along the road of life. Okay, you know what purpose of guardrails is? You know, there's one on this side, one on this side, and basically it keeps you from going over the edge. Now, it's not too big a deal if you're going down a straight level road, but if you've ever been on a mountain road, you know how important this is. You know, over there is three or 400 feet drop, And that guardrail there is to keep you from going off of the road and having total loss and devastation. Well, God's word is exactly that. God's word are the guardrails that keep us from making dumb decisions or taking dumb actions that will lead to total loss and devastation. God gave us the book as guardrails. And if we learn that and we practice that, then we're going to remain and abide in his love. But resist it. You know, I don't think I've ever said before that I think God gave me a dream. I think God gave me a dream. It happened sometime right before wake-up time about 5 o'clock in the morning. It was very fresh in my mind. I was sitting around a table with young people that I seemed to know. I was the older guy, and they were the younger guys. And they were talking about uh, TLA. TLA. TLA this and TLA that. And I'm going, what does this mean? What does this mean? And like a light went off in my head. And I realized they were talking about, now this is true, by the way. This is not some made-up deal. Total loss of authority total loss of authority. And I thought about our world, and, and frankly, so many of our, our, our young millennials you know, that are outside the church particularly, they want a world that has no authority. They want a world that simply says, if, I mean, we did the if it feels good, do it thing in the 60s. They're taking it to a whole different level. But it's not just the millennials. It's our culture. It's our culture. Total loss of authority. And what's really weird is that I was walking out the door with one of our young men. And he looked at me and said, you know what? I believe that, TLA. I said, dude, how can you? How can you believe in a total loss of the authority on your life? And he was driving, and we're in our car, and we come to a stop sign, and, and he stopped. And I said, you don't believe in, you, you want the total absence of authority and yet you stop for a stop sign because he knew that, that without traffic rules, there would be chaos. Well, I really think culture, and I'm afraid some of us are like that today. We, we see God's word as something that's archaic. It's out of date. But we don't understand it's an object of God's love for us because he wanted to give us something that would protect us from total loss and from total devastation. But now you're going... It's great, Dwayne. You should pick that for another sermon series. It has nothing to do with joy. <laughs> yeah, I told you to wait. Well, now's the time. It's, the, it's time now. Verse 11. I have told you, Jesus said, I have told you these things. I have told you to remain in my love, to be a permanent resident in my love. I have told you to keep my commands so you can remain in my love. And then he says this. I have told you these things, those two things, so that my joy may be in you, and your joy may be full. So the secret sauce then to joy is remaining in God's love and obeying His word. The secret sauce to joy is remaining in God's love and obeying His word. But we need to add an adjective there because it's not, I'm not talking about the world's joy I'm not talking about the emotion that we see on, you know, when we watch a romantic comedy, a chick flick, you know. Uh, I'm not talking about something Disney might come out with that makes you feel good. I'm talking about biblical joy. 
And this is that thing that I told you you had to wait for. It's, it's just a recurring, it's a recurring teaching that, that God laid in my heart now probably two years ago. And it keeps popping up because I think it's that important. You know, biblical joy is a deep sense of well-being. And that will tie in well next week with our sermon on peace. You know, biblical joy is a deep sense of well-being. Based on what, Dwayne? Not, listen, not circumstances going well. Not, not, oh, I got a promotion at work. Oh, I got a new truck. Oh, I got a new boat. Or this or that. No, 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 no. Biblical joy is a deep sense of well-being based on faith in God and trust in his sovereign will. Now, this is a real game changer when we start understanding what the Bible says about joy and, and what that means. Okay, it's, it's just, it's huge. Um, when, Jesus, when Jesus was facing the cross, the author of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 12 and part, uh, verse 2, the second part, says this. Because of the joy awaiting him. In other words, because of his faith in God... And, and trust in his sovereign will, he could see the outcome in a different way. He, he knew this. He knew the nails. He knew spears. He knew crown of thorns. He knew being spit upon. He knew his beard being plucked. Um, he knew the sharpness and harshness of the Roman soldiers and the crowd and the Jewish leadership that hated him. He knew that he was becoming sin. He knew that his father was going to turn his back on him. And he knew... The wrath of God, his father, was coming upon him. He was able for the joy by trusting God and, and also uh, trusting his sovereign will. All right? he, because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross. He was able to go through the cross because of his faith in God and trust in his sovereign will. Okay? And he's able to disregard its shame. He was able to throw off the shame. Now, this is so good. Some of you feel like you're being crucified. I mean, life, life, no saying, say, God, life seems it's just crucifying you. It's one bad deal after another. When you planned your life, it wasn't what you planned. When, when you think about your marriage, it wasn't what you planned. When you think about parenthood, it wasn't what you planned. You're talking about your career, it wasn't what you planned. He gives us the power by faith in Him and trust in sovereign will to endure. To endure. We follow Jesus' example. He was able to endure His cross, and by trusting in God and faith in His sovereign will, we, we also can endure our cross. You need this. I'm telling if, if you needed this right before March of 2020, didn't you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. We can throw off its shame. Sometimes Judy will ask me, I, I, have, I have some really weird personality quirks, low self esteem and things like that. And she goes, What happened to you that caused this? And I really don't know. I mean, I have some bumps. Everybody's got bumps. I had some bumps, you know, bullied in school and things said to me that were unkind, you know. But because of faith in God and trust in His sovereign will, we can throw off that shame. Now look at me. Some of y'all need to throw off that shame today. Amen. Some of you need to throw off that shame. You have lived with shame all your life. It could be a failure in your past. And Satan won't let you forget it. And sometimes your friends won't let you forget it. And maybe your husband and wife won't let you forget it. Or maybe your parents won't let you forget it. Forget it. When you have faith in God and trust in his sovereign will, you can disregard it. And the end is always better than beginning. See, now he is seated in a place of honor beside God's throne. And if we'll wait and trust God, the end's going to be better than the beginning. The end is going to be better than the beginning. If we'll just trust God. You know, one of my favorite quotes of C.S. Lewis about joy is this. Joy is the serious business of heaven. Once again, that's good. Thank you, C.S. We appreciate that. But when you add our biblical definition of joy, it really makes sense. See, because, you know, it's true because faith and trust... You know, faith in God and trust in his sovereign will 
are the serious business of heaven. And if joy, if joy, if biblical joy is faith in God and trust in his sovereign will, then all of a sudden it fits very well with serious business in heaven. You know, the Bible says in Hebrews 11 and 6 that we are to, we are, no, I'm sorry, without faith, it's impossible to please God. In 2 Corinthians 5, 7, you know, we are people who walk by faith and not by sight. That's why, that's why C.S. said that. This is serious business because faith and trust in God are very serious businesses. Now, one word of warning. Earthly joy and happiness can only be described as anemic substitutes for biblical joy. Now, you'll be in a culture like we live in, okay, we will be tempted to be drawn in looking for earthly joy and happiness. That's what you can buy at Walmart. That's what you can buy down at the Ford dealership. That's the promotion you get. Nothing wrong with promotions. That's the promotion you finally get in your business as you climb the corporate ladder. It's when you finally reach retirement age and you can do it just like you thought you could do it. All that. You know, don't, listen, nothing wrong with those things, but don't be sucked into them thinking that's what joy is all about. It's just an anemic substitute. Amen. See, 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 we should never substitute fake for real or temporal for eternal. That's right. Think about this. Now, you, you, have, a, you have a diamond. You have a choice. A guy's going to give you a diamond. Would you rather have a half-carat, genuine diamond... Or would you rather have a two-carat uh, cubic zirconium? That's a fake diamond. I mean, boy, think of your friend. I mean, seriously, you know, a, zub- a zirconium is like, like it's 9.5 on the hardness scale on a scale of 10. A diamond is a 10. Your friends would be impressed. They would look at that thing sparkling on your finger and say, Woohoo! Would you rather have a fake or a smaller reel? Real is always better than fake, even when the fake seems bigger, shinier, and better. Don't get sucked into earthly joy and happiness. It's only temporal and not eternal. It's only temporal and it's not eternal. So to help us along that path, okay, we go to our half-brother of Jesus, Brother James. Okay? And James writes in James chapter 1, verse 2, he says, Dear brother and sisters, see, see, we got this, we have to make this choice. You know, there are choices we have to make in, in the Christian life. And you're going to have to choose over earthly happiness or holiness. You're going to have to choose over earthly happiness and holiness. All right? You're going to make that choice. In James 1, 2, James helps us. He says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles, trials, when troubles or trials of any kind come your way, and do they come? Yeah, yeah they come. Sometimes we get, a, a, we get a deal at Walmart and get a whole year's worth. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it, weigh it out, figure it out, write it out. Consider it, figure it out, an opportunity... See, God is for you and not against you. Amen. It's an opportunity for great joy. It's an opportunity to trust God more and trust his sovereign will more. When, when you have those trials and opportunities, James says, don't think God is against you. Don't think God is mad at you. He's got a bigger plan than that, and he's working it. And the op- it's an opportunity for you to trust God. It's an opportunity for you to trust God. His sovereign will. It's huge. It's huge. It's important. Okay? Um, Matt Chandler. Matt Chandler is one of our, our young pastors, um, non Southern Baptist, has a church down in um, Fort Worth, Dallas, Fort Worth area uh, called The Village. And uh, he was a young pastor back in 2009. Hang on, let me look. I don't want to give you wrong information. 2009, he was 35 years old. Life was great. And Matt's the kind of guy that you like. He's just a nice guy. Well, on Thanksgiving morning of 2009, he had a a massive seizure. So they take him to the hospital, and they admit him to the hospital. They do a CAT scan 
and they discover a malignant brain tumor. Notice I said malignant brain tumor. I remember reading about this going, oh my gosh, he's 35 years old. Oh my goodness. He's, he's doing what God wanted him to do. He's pastoring. He's trying to do it right. Blended brain tumor. Well, his has a really great ending. You know, he had people pray for him, and I honestly believe it was, thy will be done. God, if God, you want me, that's great. God, if you want to heal me, that's great. God chose to heal him. In the summer of 2010... Um, yes, he had surgery, removed the brain tumor. Yes, he did chemo. But the bottom line is, here we are these years later, and he's healed. He's healed. Now, I tell you all of that for a reason, because of what he said. If Matt Chandler was a typical pastor, whether he'd be 67 or 35, would not matter. It's kind of like the young pastor who wants to preach a wedding series, a marriage series, a family series on how to stay married, and he's been married two years. Okay, If that was the case, I wouldn't even put that up there. But I know Matt's story. And now you know Matt's story. And now he has a right to say that. Because he lived that. The Christian views trials as a pathway to maturity. And I promise you this, Matt Chandler is a different man because of the hurt God allowed in his life. God is not against him. God is for him. But sometimes being for us means difficulty and hard times. Amen. That's what James was talking about. Count it all joy. Count it as a great opportunity for faith and trust in his sovereign will. Believe that. Know that. See, teaching point, you know, is, is trials tend to squeeze the artificiality. And you know that's not my kind of word. You know I didn't write that one. Okay? So here's, here's the Dwayne Taylor version. Trials tend to squeeze the fake out of us. Amen. Trials tend to squeeze the fake. You know, we can all smile and talk about how we love Jesus and we're all about grace and all that, but when we've been hurt and wounded, how's the grace level then? Yeah. When, when God allows a trial to come in our lives, it's very difficult. How is it then? You know, you know, trials tend to squeeze the fakeness out of us, leaving the essence of what we really are and clarifying what we really yearn, yarn for, yearn for. Whew. Wow. How, see, that's why James said, count it all joy when you come into these temptations and trials. Because God can take them and make them something that's profitable um, for His glory and for our good. Um, the Lord showed me something in Psalm 118. And you, you take it and see, what you, see if you think. In Psalm 118, 22, there's a scripture that we know is a prophecy about the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? And I got that. Uh, it's in the New Testament, too. You know, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The stone that the builders rejected have become the cornerstone. And, and Jesus was the stone. He was the young rabbi, teacher, Messiah. And we know that he was rejected, that the temple turned against him, the Roman government turned up against him, and he was rejected. But now the end is better than the beginning. Now he's become the cornerstone. And the cornerstone is what everything hinges on. Everything hinges on. So, so he started out, and, and we all applaud and say, Yay, Jesus, as he walked around healing people. But then, in the plan of God, and you're going to see that in just a moment, in the plan of God, he was rejected. He was crucified on a Roman cross. He endured all that I talked about earlier. And through that, God made him more. Amen. He made him the cornerstone. He made him the cornerstone. Amen. And it seemed like, wanting to be careful not to violate Scripture, but it, it seemed to me that, that there's a process here. There's what's happening now. There's what might happen. And the end result. Let's let that stone there be maybe a dream in your life that you had. Let's make it a hope that you had. Maybe your plan was to be happily married and have three, four, five kids and grow old together. Maybe in your dream you got the degree and you wanted to climb the corporate ladder. You want, perhaps in a good way you wanted to help people. And suppose the family never came. Suppose the career never happened. 
Maybe you had that stone was your dream and it was rejected. Maybe not yet. But keep trusting God. Keep having faith in His sovereign will and you're going to see it become a cornerstone. Because the end is better than the beginning. The end is better than the beginning. Some of us have lived long enough to experience this over and over again. Okay, and oh, 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 and by the way, the cornerstone might be heaven. It may not be here. But you mark it down. God is good. God is faithful. God can be trusted. And sometimes the cornerstone happens here, and sometimes it doesn't. So if you lose your dream, it feels like it's rejected. Remember, in the end, God has something better. Now hang with me because you're saying, okay, well, okay, I'm not following the joy thing. Okay, look at verse 23. In verse 23, this is the Lord's doing. Now, when we can reach a point in our lives, when we understand that God is sovereign, things get better. Amen. When you start understanding God is sovereign, listen, listen, woo -hoo, woo -hoo. circumstances are not in control, okay? Oh, Satan is not in control. God is in control. God is sovereign. This is the Lord's doing. This was the Lord's doing. He knew what the price would be for sin. It was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. We sing massive songs looking back on this. And if you'll learn in the circumstances of your life, the dreams that die, just remember it's the Lord's doing. Everything is Father-filtered, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Trust God, trust His sovereign will, it'll be marvelous in your eyes. Okay? Remain in His love. <laughs> Remain in His love. Keep His commands, it'll be marvelous in your eyes. Then you say, well, Dwayne, what's that got to do with joy? Everything. Everything. Look at verse uh, 24. This, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I'm telling you what James said. Learn to rejoice. No matter how difficult it is, learn to rejoice because the God who loves you is in control. And his ultimate goal is not to make you happy, but to make you holy. Amen. And by the way, let me just throw this out too. And he's preparing us for heaven. Yep. This is not our home. This is Walmart. You don't want to live in Walmart. He's got a mansion. He's got dwelling places. He's got rooms prepared. For us. All right, let me give you four quick, and these are not teaching points, they're just take homes, but you'll have to write fast or use the worship event. There's four keystones. We Eugene and I were talking the other day, and in a Roman archway, they would build it with stones and they would curve this way, and in the middle was a wedge shaped stone, and all the weight of the arch was on that stone. You take that stone out, and the archway collapse. So here's four keystones with joy in your life. Four, and again, these are not in the worship event, so you're going to need to type them in. All right, here we go. Number one, live a life of faith and trust. Live a life of faith and trust. Okay, faith in God, trust in His sovereign will. Here's what Paul said, Philippians 4, 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Be, be joyful in the Lord always. In fact, I'll say it again, he says, rejoice. So learn, reach a point in your life when you are willing to have faith in God and trust in His sovereign will, no matter what circumstances say, I'm going to trust God and trust His sovereign will. Live a life of faith and trust. Number two is this. Um, um, the life of faith and trust is our strength. A life of faith and trust is our strength. I've got to be quick. Um, you know, Nehemiah, you know, they, they built the wall back. They're free from Babylon, but things are really, really difficult. They have a little worship service. Um, Ezra rings for the word of God for like four hours. They're standing there, and they're overwhelmed. And they're weeping, but they're not weeping out of sadness. They're weeping out of joy. They're just overcome with the goodness of God. And Nehemiah says this, go and eat, good Baptist. Go and eat what is rich. Drink what is sweet. Send portions to those who have nothing prepared. In other words, share. Since today is holy to our Lord. Don't grieve because the joy of the Lord is our strength. 
So faith in God and trust in the sovereign will is our strength. If we want to not be empty in our Christian faith, we've got to have faith in God, trust in his sovereign will. The third thing is this. Um, life is better when we do it God's way. Scripture, Proverbs 17, 22, a joyful heart is good medicine. A joyful heart is good medicine. A heart filled with faith in God and trust in his sovereign will is good medicine. If not, we'll, dry, we'll have a dried up spirit that dries up like bones. That's just the way it is. And again, so many of us feel that way in our Christian faith because faith in God and trust in his sovereign will is not a key stone in our life. The last one is this, Psalm 51, 12. You know the David and Bathsheba story? This is part of that prayer of repentance. He says, restore to me, David says, the joy. Restore to me my faith in you and trust in your sovereign will, the joy of your salvation, and make me willing to obey. See, keystone number four is we serve. Somebody say we serve. We serve, we serve a God of restoration and rescue. That's so good. That's rich. We serve a God of restoration and rescue. But it hinges on our repentance. As long as we want to hold on to our sin, as long as we want to live in Walmart and not take up residence, okay, then he cannot bless us like he wants to. He wants to restore us. He wants to rescue us. But it hinges on our repentance. Let me read something to you. Um, this is part of that story. This is, this is what's happening in our culture. And I think this is what's happening in many of our lives. It starts with a question, what's gone wrong? The person on the lowest rung on the economic ladder in America has it better than most other people in the world today. You remember that? We read it earlier. We have all those things that citizens of other countries dream about, yet we still have a sense of emptiness. Why? Here's the answer. President Lincoln was right. We have forgotten God. And it's even truer today than when he made that proclamation in 1863. We tried to push God out of the classroom, the courtroom, and for all practical purposes, out of our culture. Here's the question. Will good ever prevail over evil? Or are we simply doomed to failure? The answer to America's problems is not political. It's spiritual. Amen. I don't want you to miss the last line. We need to turn back to God. And that is true for our nation, but it's true for us. It's true for us. Would you bow your heads, please? If you're here today, I, I try to make it a point to make very clear what Jesus did on the cross for us and for you. And if you're here today and you've never made that commitment to Jesus Christ, my friend Brent's going to be standing down front. And you're going to take that huge step to come down and say, Brent, I want to know more about that the man who died on the cross. This, this love. And we'll be glad the best we can to share it with you. If we have to make an appointment to come to your house, we'll do that. We want you to know Jesus. Maybe you're here today and you realize you live in Walmart. You have a very fleeting view of God's love for you. You don't know what it means to remain. And because of that, your life feels very, very empty. Jesus invites you home. Come home. Take up residence. Remain in my love. And then out of that love, biblical joy will come. Biblical joy will allow you to have a life that has faith in God and trust in a sovereign will. This is a game changer. This is a game changer. And God, I want to thank you for the privilege that is mine to share this truth today. Father, I know how it speaks to my heart. I pray, Father, that we will become a people of faith, a people willing to trust your sovereign will even when circumstances and culture say we are foolish to do so. I pray for my friend who might be here today who has never trusted you, that he's tried religion or she's tried religion and that's failed. 
and it should. Help them discover what a relationship with Jesus feels like. Bring them home to you. And help us, Father, to be a people who walk by faith, trusting in your sovereign will. And Jesus, we pray in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Hey, why don't we stand to our feet? Brent's going to be waiting for you here. Our team has a song for you. This is our time of decision. If you want to come pray, the altar is open. If you want to pray for a situation that you know of in your family, uh, please come. Please come as we have this time of decision. confess bowing here I find my rest and without you I fall apart you're the one that guides my heart Lord I need God's people said amen. amen. Can we give? Yeah, come on. Give him a big round of applause. Amen. Amen so much. Listen, it's been great to be with you. I hope we come out. God's given us a beautiful afternoon. Enjoy the picnic this afternoon at 4 o'clock at the park. I'll let Brent give one more detail details of that. But I need to do something special right now. I look over here, and there's that little sweet lady called Laverne Clayton. Her and her team did a wonderful job decorating our stage. Would you tell them thank you, please? Amen. And I mean that, Laverne. I saw it from here, but I was back at the sound booth, and I think I was on Bill, I think. I said, Bill, that stage looks good, and it does. Thank you so very much. Okay, Brother Brent. All right. Now, don't forget to park today. Man, we need you to have fellowship, okay? Without you, we don't have fellowship, so. And you got a port and park. Bring nice. some ice cream. Come have a good time. Bring your lawn chair. Uh, bring a fan if you want to. It's great. It's going to be good. God's blessed us with some beautiful weather. It's not scorching hot, so 
It's good. So come and enjoy. Bring a bathing suit, swim, whatever. Four o'clock at the park, we're going to eat. Five, we've got the swimming pool from five to seven. Come enjoy the fellowship. And after seven, when it gets dark, we get the fireworks. So, man, God's good, isn't he? And guys, hasn't it been good to be in God's house today? I've been teaching the kids, and man, I've been at camp. I'm on fire. These kids down here are on fire. God wants us to put them first. God wants us to seek him most of all. Can we do that? In his strength, we can. But we need to strive every day to say, hey, God, you get this day. Help me rejoice in this day. And take it as a gift from God strive to do the things that he's called us to do, to be the light, to walk with him day by day. And it's hard, guys, I know, but God's going to win because he gives us the Holy Spirit to do the good works that we need to do. Amen? You believe that? All right, let's go to Lord in prayer. Tell me, Father, I'm so excited. Man, this is good to be in the house of the Lord. It's good to hear that you have a plan of joy, dear my Father. This place isn't our home, but we love it. We want other people to know that we're living for eternity. We're living to spend it with you. And we thank you for providing a way that we can get there. It's not through our works. It's by trust. It's by faith in you that you do what you need to do to get us there. Help us to honor you. Help us to uh, find joy in you. Because, tell me, Father, this place is miserable and we can't find joy in you. And, tell me, Father, help us to praise you all the time. Things might not look joyous at the time, but help us to see the joy in putting you first, putting you in our lives, and allowing you to win the battles. In Jesus' name I pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thanks for